Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for, for coming out. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm happy to see that, and I see a lot of new faces, too. Who's the first time here? Raise your hand. Half, about half the room. Awesome. So we are blessed today to have Jeremy's better half with us as well, man in the Facebook Live. Um, for those who, of you who don't know uh, what we do here, um, we record this and we live stream this because this information then is, we upload to our YouTube channel so you can go back and replay it all the time and it's helped a lot of people. So if you missed anything here today, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, just go on to YouTube and search Dylan Borland um, or follow us on Facebook, which is up here, Dylan S. Borland, however all that stuff works. Uh, and that's it. So I like to start with kind of a brief introduction as to what this group is about. Those of you guys who have come here often know and understand what this group is about, but there are also are some new people here, so bear with us. Uh, we have people of all different skill levels. We have people who have never done a deal. We have people who have done many deals. A lot of the same stuff, uh, you may hear the same questions over and over, right? But anybody who's actually learning and growing knows that when you keep hearing and solidifying the same stuff over and over, um, it's good for you, okay? So um, don't be shy to ask a question if you have it. This group is not like your normal RIA meeting uh, where we get together and network um, or where um, sometimes we'll have, like today, we've got Tobias Lipsky with us. I'll introduce him in a moment where we'll have somebody come in and talk about a topic real quick. But this is a coaching session. And this started as a very small group, a very intimate setting with a few people. And my goal is to help you guys in a group setting Take your business to the next level. That's what this is about. So everybody that's in this room today, you're at different stages in your real estate investing. Think of a question. Where are you at right now in your business? What can I do to help move you forward? That's what we want to drill down at these sessions today. Okay? This isn't like you know, come back and drink some coffee on a Saturday afternoon because you got nothing else to do. Right? This is we want to help you guys take your business to wherever you want to go. Okay? I've been investing since 2006, tell you a little bit about myself, 20 seconds. I've done over 2,000 real estate investment transactions. Since then, the vast majority of them have all been single family residential, but we've also um, done very well with multifamily property, as you guys know, and we've gone for big like mid-rise buildings downtown, for example. So um, there's no question that I typically can't uh, answer or handle, um, but please, this is group participation. The more questions you guys ask me, the better I can help you, right? That's what this is about. So think about, as we're talking today, questions that you may have, because we're going to start with 30 minutes with Tobias. We'll open it up for Q&A with him, and then we'll jump into the last hour. Usually these run about two hours into the group coaching session, okay? And those of you who do know me know that I don't, uh, I don't hold anything back. I tell you exactly what we're doing in our business today, um, and I don't hide anything or, or you know, hold back information because I'm scared I'm going to go out there and create competitors. That's not the kind of person I am. There's enough business out there for everybody. So I tell you exactly what we do um, in, in our real estate invest, investing business every day, and uh, we put all of our cards out there. So um, let me give you a brief introduction. My good friend, Tobias Lipsky. Tobias is... What's your official title? General counsel. General counsel. Okay. So Tobias is with a firm called Schneiderman and Sherman. Has anybody heard of Schneiderman and Sherman? Okay. So if you buy foreclosure properties, Schneiderman and Sherman, in my opinion, is the second largest foreclosing attorney in the state of Michigan. Is that fairly accurate to say? You're the largest, probably. Second. Okay. Because the largest typically is what? Your competitor trot. Okay, so if you guys, I remember sitting in a room like this in uh, Oakland's RIA, and just like you guys out in the audience, and Tobias was speaking, and I went and introduced myself, he has been instrumental for me in my business in terms of anything that has to deal with foreclosures or real estate-related issues. He is a godsend a lot of times, so I speak very highly of Tobias. Um, he's a guy who you want to shake hands with. Don't leave this meeting today without grabbing his card and getting to know him because he can help you a lot in your business, okay? And also save your rear end a lot. 
How many times have you saved my rear end? You stopped counting? 100% of the time. <laughs> 100% of the time. Thank you. So, and he likes lunches, so take him out to nice, ex nice, good lunches. Don't, uh, <coughs> don't cheap out on us. So, Tobias is going to spend um, about 30 minutes today with you guys talking about various um, title issues that you should probably be aware of and what, how to probably correct some, okay? Uh, and then he's going to open up to Q&A um, from the audience, and then I'm going to say, you know, don't be shy. Ask him questions. Maybe if it's not even title questions, okay, right? Just maybe foreclosure questions, that type of stuff. Utilize him because he's very expensive, and he's here today donating his time to you guys. So uh, he's a good, um, a good resource, okay? So let's welcome Mr. Tobias. With that said, you got a big reputation to live up to now, so yeah, well, the, the no pressure. The first, first question I have is, is how soon can I replay that introduction for my family when I get home? <laughs> That's right. Well, it's live right now, so you could, they could jump on and hear it. Let and me find a chair here, actually. And, uh, and Dylan says I'm, I'm, I'm very expensive uh, for him. So uh, for everyone else, we can probably work something out. Um, yeah. Well, thank you to Dylan and the Borland Group for having me. Dylan asked me to speak, and I thought it would be appropriate to touch on the topic of title defects and cures. Um, 30 minutes isn't a lot of time, um, although I do tend to talk fast, slouch, and mumble. So if you see any of those things happen, uh, just yell at me. I'm used to it. Um, You're slouching. I'm slouching already. <laughs> All right. So before I talk about title issues and how to fix those title issues, above all else, uh, nine times out of ten, there's title insurance available, meaning you're buying a property from someone, and when they got the property, they purchased an owner's policy. So if you have an issue, the first question you need to ask is, is this covered under the policy? In other words, do I even have to pay, or does my seller even have to pay to get this fixed? Look that on video. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not going to blame myself for that. So you got to find out if there's insurance, because if there is insurance, you're going to reach out to whatever agent issued that policy, or you'll reach out directly to the carrier on that policy via the seller and say, hey, we, we've got this issue. Here's a new commitment raising this issue. Here's your policy that said no issues. So um, if uh, there's insurance involved, you have to explore that. Your costs will be covered. They might need to go so far as retaining an attorney to fix the problem. No expense to you and your seller. And you might end, actually end up working with me because we do get retained uh, to resolve these issues by the major title insurers in the state of Michigan. Well, the, the thing about uh, title insurers are, are very unique, and uh, I'm off camera now, aren't I? So they, uh, um, they, um, they're helpful. So if you're not accustomed to that with insurance companies, that's the experience you'll get at least half the time with a title insurance company. Um, they issued a policy. They spent a lot of time trying to make sure that there were no issues. They do preemptive work so that when they issue that policy, they're hopefully comfortable that they're insuring something that's pristine. Um, and how often do they issue clear title? They issue a policy if you pay for it 100% of the time, but you might find uh, maybe 40% of transactions require uh, some additional action at the next uh, transaction. And um, underwriters and agents honor a mutual indemnity agreement. And what that agreement allows for is based on a short list of defects, if you just pass the policy from the old agent to the new agent, the new agent just honors the old policy, you're done. So sometimes getting a copy of the policy is all you need to move forward with your transaction. Um, 
And as I said, uh, our, I personally and other members of the firm routinely get retained by those insurance, insurance companies to fix those issues. Um, I also want to talk about quieting title. That might be what you would expect me to talk about during my entire segment. It's not. Um, I spend a lot of time, myself and my support staff, finding non-judicial ways to fix these issues. Many times they uh, can be fixed without any court involvement, without filing a complaint, without a $2,000 attorney bill. Um, maybe a divorce judgment needed to be recorded. Uh, maybe there's an extremely minor uh, defect in a legal description, and the current title agent you're working with is just being too careful. Um, but if you can't resolve the title issue with, with a document or an agreement uh, or research, then um, you are going to have to uh, retain an attorney to uh, file what's called a quiet title action in the state of Michigan. And um, it's going to cost you roughly $2,000 attorney fee. I mean, that's, that's going to be your average price. There are people that are less. There are people that are more. But if, if, that's, if that's what you're being charged for, an uncontested quiet title, you're, you're in good hands. Um, and in addition to like $150, dollar complaint filing fee and motion fee. Best case scenario, you will get a judgment of default against anyone that has an interest that you're clearing about 85 days after um, you retain an attorney. Best case scenario. So that's, that's something to think about. Yes, there's a land bank out there and through the Detroit or Michigan Land Bank, you can expedite things. Um, I'm not involved in that personally. Uh, it requires conveying your title interest to uh, a governmental agency. Um, not something I would personally feel comfortable with unless I had a personal relationship with the people in that office, which I, I don't at this time. It doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. All right, so I think that's probably half hour already. I'm just going to get started now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you next month. Okay, um, so we're here now. Breaks in the chain. Breaks in the chain of ownership in land. Uh, I also call it uh, missing interest because you could have uh, a break of an entire ownership interest or um, someone's uh, husband or wife didn't sign an instrument. So Let's assume it's very simple. You've got a chain of title, A to B, and C to D. You don't have B to C. Um, in more instances than not, someone has a photocopy of an unrecorded deed. Maybe it's defective in some way. Maybe it's missing the two and a half inch top margin, and for some silly reason, uh, the original even didn't get recorded. Um, and oftentimes you're not going to have that. But if you do, you can get that deed recorded to cure the break in the chain. Uh, as an ex if it is recorded as an exhibit to an affidavit, signed by someone that a title company would be comfortable with them signing. So the grantor, of course, but if you're talking to the grantor, you might as well get a new deed. Um, the attorney who drafted the document. Is there a title company stamp on that photocopy? Reach out to that title company and say, hey, it looks like you closed this, sign this affidavit. I've done all the work for you. Thank you very much. Um, so an objective party, uh, so the, the title agent you're working with today doesn't feel like the signer is doing it in a self-serving fashion. Um, so that's a, that's a cure based on insurance. Sometimes you just do enough to get title insurance. Sometimes you just do enough to get legal title and depending on the situation, one is more conservative and one is more liberal than the other. Either way, you, you get it done so you can close. Um, if you can't uh, get anyone to sign, you don't have any of those parties that I suggested, on the deed, there's a lot of helpful information if you have a copy. I mentioned the attorney who it might have said drafted by, uh, the grantor's old address, a title company stamp. Those people 
can be used to help you get in contact with the grantor. Um, even the notary name. If you give me a notary name, 75% uh, of the time, I'm going to find someone who knows that notary, I'm going to find that notary, and I'm going to jog their memory. Um, you'd be amazed at, at uh, what, what you can get from uh, that information. So let's say you don't have a copy of this deed um, that um, would, would make everything dandy for you. Um, you need a deed. You need to find this grantor. You need to become a detective or hire someone who uh, you know, usually works in title curative. You're going to look on the internet. You're going to, um, you know, you'll see whitepages.com. You might have an accurate subscription for some reason, which will give you a whole bunch of information. You might pay for a special service that uh, gets you the last known address. Um, oftentimes, I get leads from things that are published on the internet that no one had any idea were going to be published. Uh, was going to be published membership in a in a local uh, organization. Um, just s searching by using the information you have up front or working backwards, um, using their old address, and it's just, uh, it's, it's detective work. Um, you also want to look at court documents. Is this grantor, who's going to fix everything for you, are they alive? Um, is it possible that their interest was actually extinguished uh, by a divorce proceeding and nobody recorded the judgment or nobody recorded the deed that that judgment said was supposed to go from one X to the other. Happens all the time. Um, speaking of a deceased party, how you address fixing a break in the chain when your signer is deceased will depend on what kind of break you have. I told you that we're dealing with a uh, a B to C situation. I probably should have written it out. So we A to B is good, B to C is missing, missing, C to D is good. Um, with our scenario, I designed a document that title insurers are comfortable with. It's a deed signed by all surviving heirs, so you have to find them, and an affidavit by an objective party saying, there's no one else who could have an interest in this property, and I have no interest in this property. Um, and this is an affidavit given under an oath. This saves you the cost and expense of opening up a probate case, finding someone who wants to be the PR, possibly even having to then open up a circuit court case to sue the estate that you just created in the probate case. Um, when your break is a break that um, it's, the, it's the vesting break, meaning your seller doesn't have a deed to him or her, then you need to get a PR involved, um, which means you have to open up a probate case. If there happens to be a trust out there um, that holds the interest that, that, that was never conveyed to your seller, then you're doing some research to try and find out who the present trustee is, because that's your signer. Um, and I think that's all I have on uh, that part. So I also want to talk about Dower. Does anyone know what happened with Dower yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. The governor signed the three bills abolishing Dower. Um, now, Specifically, what it means is, um, I think the magic date is going to be March 6th. So starting March 6th, we don't care. But if any, um, anyone becomes a widow, uh, if a woman becomes a widow in the next 90 days, they still have the right to elect dower, which no one does. They always uh, elect according to... Um, EPIC, the Estates uh, Protected Individual Code. But um, so if you have a, um, a missing interest, meaning the husband conveyed um, property, it wasn't her principal residence, I'll get to that in a minute, um, and a title company is telling you wife's dower interest attaches, um, 30 day, 90 days from now you can say, no, it doesn't. 
And um, so um, those, those bills have been sitting out there for a year. And, and I did everything I could to, to uh, try and get those moved along on two different legislative committees I was a part of at the time. All right, so we're still on break in the chain, but I wanted to talk about a break caused by a defect in a mortgage. So how does a defect in a mortgage cause a break in a chain of title? What has to happen with that mortgage? Foreclosure. If you have a defect in a mortgage and there's a foreclosure, your chain of title comes from that defective mortgage. Um, the rules are the same though. Um, if, if you had a mortgage where the co-owner didn't sign, you're seeking out that co-owner. Um, if the wife didn't sign the mortgage, um, subject to dower being abolished, um, you're going to pursue that wife for a deed. Non-owner occupant spouse didn't sign the mortgage. So that means married couple, only the man's on the deed. I'm sorry, man or woman is on the deed. Let's say the woman. Let's, let's say that the wife is on the deed, and this is their primary residence. There's an awful law in the state of Michigan that talks about homestead rights, and if the husband doesn't sign this particular mortgage, uh, the mortgage is not valid. It talks about that in the context of collection on a judgment. Many agents and underwriters... Um, to their credit, because of some opinion that came out many years ago, interpreted that to mean the mortgage isn't valid. They're wrong. Um, if you acquire title through a sheriff's deed and you have title work that says invalidity of the sheriff's deed and mortgage because of homestead rights, they're wrong. Escalate it to their underwriter. Say, I, I, need, you to, I need you to talk to your underwriter and make sure that you... Um, might not reconsider, other than saying you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and then if you have trouble with that, um, yeah, <laughs> if you have trouble with that, give me a call. All right, break in the, who's, who's monitoring time? Two minutes? I am doing great. Rit? Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right. I, I would expect uh, everyone in the room to be interested in this as well. Uh, I, uh, a title defect uh, resulting from tax foreclosure. So that can cause a break in the chain because title insurance companies do not like the tax foreclosure statute. They do not like having to depend on the county sending <clears throat> three to six to nine to 12 notices to all these people who are entitled to notice. The title insurance companies do not like relying on those counties. So you may get, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the term tax title. You'll get title work that um, says that uh, you're the owner because of the deed you bought from auction, or uh, I said deed, property you bought from auction by tax deed, or your predecessor got it at tax auction. But it'll put in there with you all the, the prior lien holders and the prior owner and mortgagor on that property. Um, so, and most often when you have a title defect on your uh, title work, it's going to say, we need a judgment. And, and, I'm, and I'm here telling you, you don't always need a judgment. But you will likely be told, this is tax title, you need a quiet title. Um, and you may very well have to do that. Um, the underwriters for title insurance companies fluctuate depend uh, in their position depending on what what treasure is being sued that given year um, because people do challenge the county treasurers uh, they do not prevail typically um, but when there's an allegation out there everyone gets nervous things get put on hold but you want to whether you quiet title or you um, work around the tax issues, you need to call the county and get a copy of every single notice that they sent 
in furtherance of tax foreclosure. They provide it. You'll have their cooperation. Oftentimes, they'll use a company called Title Check. Um, they keep uh, very good records. And you want to ask your title agent, what does it need to see from what you just collected to get comfortable with this tax title? If, if they say, we're not going to work with you, then you politely say, could you please ask your other underwriter? And if they say, we only have one underwriter, then you think about whether you want to try a different title agent who does work with an underwriter who that particular week or month is comfortable looking at all the notices and saying, okay, certified notice here and here, I think I'm okay with this. And they look at the dollar amount too. Um, it's, it's risk. So, um, and if you've got just such funky title that everyone wants quiet title, then you're going to quiet title. <clears throat> so that is, um, that brings us up, up to here. I don't know how much time we have left, but I can talk. You're good, man. You're golden. You have about 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll talk about uh, prior mortgages. Um, if you had any questions during that first section, I hope you took some notes so that I can address your concerns when I'm done. But let's talk about prior mortgages. I tried to keep it narrow. I could have talked about prior liens in general, tax liens, um, judgments, construction liens, um, but um, that would take a lot longer. So category one of prior mortgage is, mortgages are, are satisfied mortgages. And, and let me create the proper context. This is just a basic, um, you're buying from a seller or you, um, yeah, you're standard buy sell transaction. Um, this isn't really an order of priority, but there are expiration dates on mortgages. Um, Michigan has a statute. Mortgage lien expires 30 days from the date of maturity. If you're looking at a mortgage loan 1980 or prior, immediately you're thinking, um, you know, why is this coming up? And this is probably matured. And agent, title agents do overlook uh, that law. Um, so hopefully that's your circumstance. Otherwise, you are uh, sending out a request for release of lien uh, from the lender. Uh, identifying the lender is a trick. Uh, but one other thing to consider is, do you need the bar borrower's authorization to try and get this release of mortgage? Well, I can tell you if you want to have a phone call with that lender and you want to talk about that account, you're not going to unless you have authorization from the borrower. However, if you send a written notice in by fax or regular mail, very to the point and highlighting that they appear to have an, a, a non-discharged satisfied lien of record, they should do something about it. And they typically do. So you can bypass uh, talking to the borrower and trying to get third-party authorization. Oftentimes, the lender that you're pursuing is dissolved. So that's very inconvenient. Um, but through detective work, you can locate the officers or directors or anyone with signing authority on behalf of that dissolved company. And they are permitted to uh, wind up the affairs of that company. Some of them are comfortable, some of them are not. My release says right in the signature line that they're signing in furtherance of the statute that permits them to wind up the affairs of the organization. Banks go out of business, banks get purchased. You might need to look at the uh, FDIC website to see who might have been acquired and who that entity was that acquired um, this old bank through the FDIC. Um, there's a website called Lane Guide. You have to subscribe. It's not very expensive, but they will tell you what happened to bank, the bank at the beginning of time and who they are today. Um, the FDIC website also, um, if it's a bank that's registered with the FDIC, I won't get into that, but um, it has a very nice history for uh, what has become of, um, I'm trying to think of an ancient bank, like a manufacturer's bank or something. Not that ancient. Um, MERS. 
Anyway, anyone? I don't. I don't. Even, I can't even think of anything any, of anything witty to say about MERS. But, um, but basically, if the mortgage you're trying to release says MERS nominee for Adams Mortgage, chances are you are not going to Adams Mortgage to get that lien release. There is a public MERS site that will tell you who the last MERS servicer was for that loan. They may have been the actual lender for that loan. They may have been a subservicer, and you have to go through them if they still exist to find out who they were subservicing for, to find out who has signing authority for the lease. But the takeaway is if you see a MERS mortgage, no assignments, and it's old, um, don't start firing letters to that, that lender. Do some, do some research to find out who actually is the present lender. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about MERS at the end. Um, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney, but I just had to deal with this yesterday. <clears throat> Chapter 13 bankruptcies allow for a lien strip. So it's possible that this lien that's sitting out there uh, was actually stripped away through the bankruptcy court proceedings. Um, so you can pull uh, the docket uh, for that particular bankruptcy proceeding or contact your attorney to do that. And maybe it's, in fact, just something that needs to be taken from this record to that record and then give you clear title. Unsatisfied mortgages. I've got two sub-scenarios for a mortgage with a balance. One is uh, a mortgage lien that... Um, uh, the first scenario is where you have title through buy-sell or where you've gotten title through a foreclosure and you kind of get to stand in the shoes of that lender that foreclosed. So let's first assume your, your standard buy-sell situation. You have to get third-party authorization to talk to that lender. It has a balance. They're not going to release it unless you negotiate. Um, you might, depending on how much this lender actually cares about this debt, they may have charged it off. It might be with Recon Trust or some other asset recovery company, and they might be willing to take 10% or so to go away. Um, I put here, wait, yeah, I put wait 30 years. Um, <laughs> And then the other thing I said is walk, because obviously if, if you've got this uh, lean, non-dischargeable, huge balance, it, it, might be, it might be more effective for you to just walk away, maybe, maybe even let it go to tax foreclosure and then go to the auction, depending on the circumstances. Okay, so this is the tail end of my presentation, and that is the situation where you have an unsatisfied mortgage on your title, and you acquired title at, uh, from foreclosure of a mortgage. So at some point in time, there's this mortgage out there that's your problem, and the mortgage that uh, you were hoping was a first mortgage that foreclosed and created your chain of title. Um, I put here third-party authorization uh, is going to be helpful not only to discuss the account with, your, with the prior lien holder, but to get things from their closing, um, and maybe even, I mean, people are more helpful than you might think. So um, you might even uh, be able to get them to show you a redacted copy of their uh, credit report. At minimum, the settlement statement from when they created, um, when they closed on the loan that foreclosed that gave you title. The bottom line is you're making... Uh, or your attorney is making a priority argument, trying to argue that the mortgage that foreclosed and gave you title um, is superior to this other earlier recorded lien as a matter of law. Um, you've got two ways to do that. One is, one is applying Michigan's race notice statute, and the other way is applying Michigan's equitable subrogation doctrine. Race notice means... Um, if you're there first without knowledge, you have priority. If you're not, you don't. So the argument, uh, and this is only going to work if the first and the second mortgage were closed the same day or the intended second was closed later but got recorded first, which happens, unfortunately, often enough. 
your argument is that this smaller mortgage that got recorded first, they knew about you. If both loans were closed the same day, that's a very strong argument that they knew about you and they're, therefore they can't have priority just because their lien got recorded first. The other way you argue that is they do a credit check on the borrower and they could see that there was an account, a large $200,000 account in favor of a well-known uh, mortgage lender. The other way to flip the priorities, and this, is, this isn't something that you are going to have to do, this is more um, what your attorney would do, uh, and I'm telling you just so that you know that there's hope if you're in this situation. And I'm going to hopefully I can I can do this right the first time. Subrogation means you step in the shoes of someone else. Michigan allows you to jump over uh, another lender under uh, only very specific facts. So, first mortgage originates at this point in time. Second mortgage originates in this point in time. Third mortgage is created by the same exact lender who holds this prior first mortgage on this date and does an internal refi of that mortgage. The courts say you can move ahead of this other second mortgage under those limited facts. So that's uh, arguably useless information, um, but, but still fun. So um, I'm ready. I'm ready for, for Q&A. Um, let, please. Let me, let me ask you guys first. Does anybody right now have a title issue that they're dealing with? I know, Greg, last month you had a title issue, but does anybody in the room have? You do? Let, let's start there and then take a couple more questions and then maybe one or two from Facebook Live, okay? Remember to repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. That's my biggest challenge. Will you remind me? <laughs> I went to a real estate and purchased a home, put money down on a home, went through all, all the aspects of it. And the same day up the closing, they called me and told me I had a $224,000 to leave. And the property was only purchased for one fourth. Did you use title insurance to cite your transaction? What did they say? Is that title agent still in business? The the question, sorry. Her fact pattern entailed closing on a purchase. And the next day, somebody told her there were several hundred thousand dollars in liens on the property. And the title agent said, I'm not going to help you, even though that's exactly why you gave me an insurance premium. Did you buy insurance? <laughs> yeah, everything was in my credit union. Every, I, as I said, it cost me probably about $3,000 I lost on this deal. Here's the important question. Was it a refi? No, it was a purchase. Do you know... Because we know the credit union got a loan policy. Did your seller buy you an owner's policy as well? That's where your coverage comes from. Yeah. So you might not, in fact, have coverage because it's very surprising to me that the agent would say, I'm sorry, um, if those liens were out there, if they issued a commitment that didn't tell you about those liens, because it's one thing that they told you, but if they didn't tell you about them and you paid your premium, you had nothing to do with the timely recording of this instrument or that instrument, I have to think that maybe, in fact, um, in your purchase agreement, um, the seller may not have been obligated to buy you insurance. Now, and I'm happy to review this with you, next week, um, but you have remedies against the seller, the seller, of course, has to be collectible. Um, and are they alive? Do they have money? Right. Yeah. Okay. We went up the real estate company. I mean, I've, I've, I've bought plenty of houses, and I've never seen them not responsible 
the agent? I'm I'm not going to point the finger at the agent in that situation uh, because they would be looking at the same title product you were, which apparently didn't disclose uh, these liens. Um, if you didn't, in fact, have insurance, then your best remedy is against the seller. If you got a warranty deed, um, that's the vehicle that allows you to uh, bring an action against them for failing to disclose um, either intentionally or neglectfully that information to you. So, yep, next. Okay. Todd? If I, um, if a reverse mortgage goes to foreclosure sale and you don't buy it at the auction and maybe you get it through the family or you get it through the, um, the owner, they walked away or they moved out out of state or whatever the reason is. I know there's two mortgages, one with the foreclosure sale and then the reverse mortgage. I think there's a mortgage. Maybe if I put a lien on the property also. Yeah. Um, is there a way to get rid of that other mortgage? Like if they, if you buy the redemption rights from whoever the family or whoever you can get the redemption rights from, is there a, a way to get the other mortgage um, Based on recent experience? Repeat the question. Yes. So many reverse mortgages are FHA HUD products and for its own protection uh, HUD has a duplicate copy of the reverse mortgage recorded in case the servicer who originated the mortgage uh, skips town, loses all of its assets. It allows, um, I think HUD is a subsidiary of the FHA, so if I flip the names, that's, that's why. It allows HUD to just have their lien, and they also have the ability to, to do an expedited judicial foreclosure through the federal court with no right of redemption, just a side note. Um, but it's a duplicate copy for the same indebtedness. So once the first, the other mortgage is extinguished, and I might get some phone calls, but once the, the, that initial mortgage is extinguished, that FHA one isn't there. It's not there. And based on recent experience, uh, use a title company who's underwritten by Old Republic. Yeah, that's, that's actually an issue that you, you help us with often. You've done, you've helped us with that in many scenarios. It's very common. Yeah, but it has to be your your scenario. The it's a duplicate copy right. because FHA does do uh, the down payment programs and such, and they do have balances yeah. and they do need to be satisfied. But there's two different scenarios yeah. that you typically see. What's the other scenario? That one being one in which, like Tobias was saying, it will drop off, and then the other scenario is where they. I know you've pointed this out to me before. Yeah. And it's like Tobias, what scenario are we in? Am I okay yeah. or am I screwed? Right. <laughs> so. Um, the other scenario is where it's it's like a uh, down payment assistance loan. Yeah. That's real. That has a balance, and you have right. Yeah. So good. Good. Hey, so get your title questions out now because as you guys, he has Tobias has literally just scuffed the surface. He has a wealth of information with title stuff. So title issues, get him while he's here, and he's gonna hang. You're gonna hang out and stay. Yeah afterwards too for any questions and stuff so anybody else got anything in the back so it depends I, I need to clarify your facts a little bit if um, if you're the taxpayer repeat the question if oh okay so she said if there's a tax default how long until you have marketable, insurable title, uh, and, th and then the rest of the question I wasn't sure of, so I'll create a couple of scenarios. One is you're the taxpayer and you have a delinquency. Basically, you pay them, and immediately you should be able to uh, convey uh, title. 
um, you might have to have the settlement agent involved in your payment. So they saw it happen, they saw a payoff because a particular county might take six months to record a uh, redemption certificate. <laughs> so if, if you are talking about you have tax title, um, then um, if quiet title is necessary, then there's that best case scenario, 85 days um, through the court system. Um, We well, already have possession. Seven years. The original owner had seven years to reclaim the property. Oh, to set aside the tax foreclosure? Well, you're going to get title insurance, so that's not your problem. I mean, that's that's my recommendation. So. Here, county. County. Not anymore. They're 100% done. Didn't they change that? So I thought you were talking about the ability to challenge the tax foreclosure judgment and auction. I know that there's there's some period of time where that can happen. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that anyone would actually succeed, and I believe they're only entitled to damages, not the actual property back. What you're talking about, we should probably talk about in a little more detail. And let me let me look into exactly what you're, because uh, I'm not aware of any circumstance where a taxpayer can show up seven years later and say, "Okay, I'm ready to pay my taxes," um, and be a problem for you. Good. Yeah. I just read the new law for There used to be a little bit of the time, but they changed all that. Maybe absolutely, you're done. Right, isn't that correct? They changed it a couple years back. I want to say like 2002. Okay, farther than back. Yeah. Question from Josh? I got a house that is in the middle of probate and set for auction this year for taxes. Who wins this? Uh, the treasurer. Repeat the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's a there's a property that has delinquent taxes. Um, did you get show cause this year? Like is it is? Uh, it's, it's this is last year. And they put the notices on the house that they're taking. Okay, this is the time of year that uh, the cases are held for all the counties, all the properties in a particular county that have delinquent taxes. From we're in 2017, so this year would be the 2014 unpaid taxes. Uh, it happens right around January, February. Judgment is entered against the property, and I believe the drop dead date is March 31, I think, and then it's gone forever for the taxpayer. Um, the question was, under these facts, if there's also a pending probate case, um, probate being administering the assets of the a deceased party, who wins? And the, the quick answer is the treasurer wins. Um, my recommendation is um, make sure that someone doesn't have the money to uh, pay those taxes now. You have until, I believe, March 31st. Um, at minimum, participate in the proceedings. Um, file an answer and explain the circumstances. Maybe they'll pull it from this year and put it back on next year, maybe. Yeah. We're gonna pause and see if Facebook Live has one or two questions, no? I just asked again. Yeah. But... Okay, you snooze, you lose Facebook Live. Yep. All right, anybody else got a question? We got time for probably two more questions for Tobias, so. Over here, please. Over here. So my question is a little bit more specific. My mother has a property that she inherited She's looking to sell it now. Um, there's a lien on the house for twenty five thousand. The house is only worth about twelve. So now she's trying to figure out how to get this lien off the house. She has full rights to, to the house. However, the lien is not because of her. The lien is because of the sister. Mm -hmm. But the financial institution that has the lien 
on the house in, in New York. My question is, how would you negotiate? How would my mother try to negotiate with the bank in New York to get that off of the house? Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, someone inherits property. The property is subject to a mortgage lien. Mor the um, outstanding debt on the mortgage lien is no more than half the market value of the property. How do you work with the bank? Um, and this is something that um, you guys and Dylan do all the time. Um, it's, it's effectively a short sale. Um, how you open up that dialogue, uh, I don't know if she received a deed from the PR of an estate or if she was a co-owner. Um, she was a co-owner, so she got obtained title by successorship. Um, you might want to explore whether or not that lien truly attached to her interest. For example, if they held title as joint tenants and, and after that this lien was created, ag arguably it doesn't attach to the property. Um, so um, you want to look at the deed to your mother and, and the deceased and see if it says uh, joint tenants of full rights or survivorship. If it says tenants in common, then you have a problem. Um, but long story short, um, you get on the phone with the institution, you explain the compelling circumstances, you uh, give them some valuations of the property, and um, prepare to pay something. So maybe have, you know, say we've got fifteen hundred dollars. Will you take that? It would really help us out, you know. So, but I would definitely look at how they own the property together. We have. A lot of times you might find too, expanding on that, that that like Tobias was saying, that lien may not be valid and actually attach, because if I give you an example, if a husband and a wife were on title, and the husband and Tobias, you can give me the technicalities behind this, but the husband took out a debt, and it was his debt. You can't have that person come and put a lien on the title because both you and your wife are on the title together. So then it would just have to be him on the title if they wanted to attach that debt to the title. Right? Yep. So, so you're protected in that way. Unless, unless him and his wife sign for the debt. Right. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? I can give you actual specifics. So in 2005, she claimed, or this is when everything went haywire in 2005. Um, at that point in time, they were both co-owners of the property. The sister, I guess, claimed interest in the property um, with the financial institution. I guess she defaulted. And that's when the institution put the lien or put the judgment lien on the house. And then the sister tried to quit claim or she did quit claim it in 2007. Huh. The quit claim, I don't know um, what, what that wrinkle adds to your facts. But one question I have is, do you know about this lien because you pulled records or because you have a title company telling you this lien is an issue? I had the title company pull it. There was an affidavit attached to it. And then we did it in this division with the affidavit. And then that's how we found out about the lien. Okay. Um, off camera, I'll ask you which agent it is, and we, and we can talk about um, exploring that a little bit further. Uh, the quick claim deed might be what the problem is, but otherwise, Otherwise, if we have two people holding property as joint tenants and a judgment creditor tries to attach a debt, uh, which is the obligation of only one of them to that real estate, then it shouldn't be able to attach. Um, so that's um, something you definitely, I mean, the title company say, might say, yeah, those aren't your facts. That's why it attaches. It might, might have something to do with that deed. No. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Or Tobias, and he's going to stay after. So if you guys have additional questions, then feel free. But the uh, farmland that you own is now divided into three pieces: lot A, lot B, lot C with the house. Where does it go? Where do the taxes go? Oh, okay, so she said, if you uh, own farmland. And it's subdivided in three parcels, one of which has your residence on it. And you pay your taxes, your real estate taxes. Where does it go? So I'm, I'm trying to 
understand the question. Is, is anyone else can explain it to me? <laughs> like, <laughs> the Bible gets three different sig right? Does it have three different parcel numbers or not? Yeah, then you get three different tax bills. And if you don't have three tax bills, then two of them are getting paid. Period. Hmm? Whenever when you send the tax bill, check your phone. Uh, oh, wrong? Wrong. Okay. Which one is it from? Which one is it? Do you know which one is the question? Are you, you're only getting one tax bill? Do you know which one is the question? No. A, B, C, three. I'm sure I'll have the simple number, right? I did that. I had 10 acres. I split it off. We have three separate ones. Yeah, and every time I, I had four. I had four separate tax bills, four separate parcel numbers. Now, if you have three lots that are on the same parcel number, then they all get paid together. It doesn't make any difference. Lot A, lot B, lot C. It's always applied to the lot with the house. So the other two are always applied to the lot with the house. Okay, and so you're telling me that you didn't pay the taxes on the other two when they took those from you? Well, if if there's only one tax ID, it, it's being you only have one tax parcel, and it's being applied to everything. And if there's only one tax bill, I don't know how you can tell that taxes aren't being paid on something. Are are the other two pieces being taxed? And they will not apply your payments to those. Are you the are you reflected as the current taxpayer on all three parcels? Yes. You had to file some property transfer affidavits. When's the last time you've had this problem? Is that when you filed the new PTAs? It's very important that when you acquire property, or I guess in this situation, if you split parcels that you file a property transfer affidavit, that's who tells the assessor who to bill for your taxes. Okay. All right, Tobias is going to stick after. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank him for his time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I wanted to bring up, so I don't want to talk about tax uh, title issues, so let's get your mind out of title and let's focus on your real estate business. Um, I did want to bring one thing up, though, before we do that. Um, in our business, we found often, and Tobias, maybe this can be a last comment from you, there's a lot of second mortgages on, on properties from Bank of America. Um, some of those second mortgages, part of their settlement with the federal government was they had to release a bulk of these second mortgages off title. So if you find yourself in a situation where you have a second mortgage on title from Bank of America, it's very likely under a program where you, you don't have to do any settlement. It's just going to be released from title. And I don't know the specifics of that program, but just pay attention to that. If you guys are in a situation, there's Bank of America Second Mortgage. Do you know the name of that program? They were required to give, like, to release, like, the vast majority of the second mortgages from the bailout. Do you remember what that was? They are not one of our clients. Okay. So I'm very interested in the information you're sharing. Oh, really? Well, there you go. Yeah, very, very common <coughs> scenario if you see a second from Bank of America. More often than not, right now, it will be released without settlement. It's part of their bailout program, okay? Yeah, yeah. Recently. Yeah, we just had one. Yeah. Yep, in, on uh, Westland, in Westland property. So, all right, so that's the last comment on title. So let me, um, Tobias will stay after, you guys can talk to him. So let me do this. So now we're going to get involved in the coaching session. So get your minds back into coaching. Where are you at in your business right now that the focus of this is that I can take you to that next step in your business, okay? How many people here are single-family residential? Just so I got an idea of the room. Single-family residential. Okay, now, how many here are fix-and-flip people, single-family residential? Okay, good. I just want to get a synopsis of who, who we're working with today. How many here are focused on just rentals? Just rentals. Okay. So there's a high, Yeah, most of you guys are hybrid. Rentals, fix-and-flip, that type of stuff. Any commercial people in the room? Commercial, Jeremy, John, okay. Now, <laughs> this thought just came to mind. And well, hold on before I get there. Any multifamily people in the room? Good. Okay. 
Okay, so I got a good idea of the crowd. Now, I know Jeremy's going to yell at me to repeat the question. I have the memory of a goldfish. I'm like Finding Nemo. What's that fish's name? Dory. Dory? If I repeat the question, I'll forget what we're talking about. So, you guys speak nice and loud, please, so that I don't have to repeat the question. Yell if you need to, okay? So let's open it up. Who's got, uh, let me erase this board here real quick. Who's got something I can help them now get to that next level? Is there a question, concern? This is coaching, guys. Anybody here have a coach or been involved in coaching? Raise your hands high. Come on. Come on. Good. A good portion of the room. Good. So a good coach is going to help you hold accountable, and a good coach should have experience in what it is that you need help with, right? Don't seek advice from somebody who hasn't done more than you has always been my philosophy. So I may, I may or may not be that guy. There's probably people in this room that have done far more than I have. Um, so let me erase this here real quick. Um, hopefully you guys got all your goals. December we talked about the goal session and setting goals. Um, hopefully you guys got your 2017 planned out because it all starts with that map, right? Um, who's got the first question? Raise your hands high. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. That's what we're here to do. I know you guys all didn't come out just to listen to Tobias, right? Did you? <laughs> come on, we got questions. Thank you, by the way. That was very good information. Oh, he's got a stack of cards up here, too, so you guys need them. Go ahead. In the back. Green shirt. Can't see your name. Sorry. Say that again? Yeah. So, good question. What was your name? Sean. Sean. So, you said if you're a newbie like me and you're looking for a coach. Um, so, there's a lot of coaches out there in this industry. There's a lot of gurus out there talking about stuff that you can hire. Um, typically, you're going to pay them, what, 30, 40, 50 grand to get their advice. Um, I have coaches and things that I do. I have a sales coach, I have an investment coach, I have a life coach. Um, typical coach, a good coach, costs you about a thousand bucks a month. Um, what I find um, better than that is you find somebody, and there's people in this room that are doing more than you right now or are where you want to be. And you latch on to them and you shadow them. They become your mentor here locally. I think that's where you should start. So what, are, what is your goal for this year? Uh, my goal is to get started in business, to learn it. I've actually been Real estate business? Yeah. Okay. I've actually been uh, attending REI uh, meetings like this the last year. Nice. Uh, I've dealt with a couple in Ann Arbor. Uh, and I've actually been to Jeremy here at Renegade. Jeremy? Jeremy? Huh? Thank you. Jeremy, if you guys don't know Jeremy Burgess. We'll talk about him, Renegade Detroit Investors. Yep. I got caught up in a situation where uh, I actually got caught out a cost of five grand for promotion uh, about a year ago. Sure. But it didn't, it all ended up being a, sort of a... Yeah, whistles and bells. Right. Or yeah. Yeah, you got you to scrutinize your coach just like your coach should scrutinize you, right? There's people that come to me and ask for coaching. I say, I can't help you. And a good coach will tell you that because it's not about this. This is insignificant. There's a reason why I limit my coaching clients to six people because I am deeply invested. Ask David. I stay up at night worrying, are these people going to succeed? i got to do everything I can do to make them succeed. This, this is just accountability. That's how I look at it. If you're dishing out this money every month, that's accountability for you to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. This doesn't make any difference to me. I make more on a fix and flip property, right? So it's accountability. So you've got to scrutinize those coaches and say, show me your background. What have you done? Can you get me to where I need to be? And the coach should be doing the same for you. There's people in this room who have said, I can't help you. Right? So, uh, but that's a good question. I would say start local. What, so what is your goal for 2017 specifically? What are you trying to accomplish this year? If you accomplish one or two things, what are they? What kind of property? A fix and flip or a rental? A rental. Okay. Who here has done more than five rentals in a year? See all these guys with their hands raised? I'm sure, and I know, I know a lot of them, I'm sure they'd be able to give you advice and you can chat them and they get you where you want to be. That's where you start. And then once you hit one, you go to five. Once you go to five, so you look for somebody who's done 10 rentals and you shadow that guy. You look for somebody who's done 20 rentals and there's plenty of those people in this room. But I think that's where you should start. Get local, find somebody here local in these meetups. That's why we're here networking as well. And uh, shadow that person. Uh, somebody who really wants to help you isn't going to charge you, you know. It's not about that. Yeah, it's not about that, right? Some of those guys, a lot of those guys, they, they fix and flip 50 houses in their lifetime, and then they can become gurus because it's easier. 
than fix and flipping 100 houses a year. And that's where they make their money. That's where they make their million dollars a year. Right? So you guys got somebody like me, I give you tons of information for free because I really want to help. Right? So a good mentor is going to help you. But you got you to let them know that you're serious. Right? That you're not wasting their time. That if I tell you something, you're out there doing it. Right? Or else they'll drop you real quick. Good question, though. Okay? What else you guys got? Oh, we got to wake you up. It's the first of the year. Come on. <laughs> we got big goals, everybody. John, go ahead. Yeah. And you're jumping into that. How does the marketing strategy change from residential Good. to multifamily? And what are you guys currently doing in regards to prospecting for multifamily? Good question. So, so John was talking about you want to you want to switch. I'm going to do both. Okay. But you want to jump into multifamily, and you're asking, what does the marketing process look like? That. The same, same, same marketing process you're going to find in any business, right? So it always starts with, you got to get a list. Where are these people located? Okay, with multifamily. Just like in residential, if you're doing fix and flip, there's lists. There's absentee homeowners. There's foreclosures. There's inherited properties. You buy those lists. And I'll tell you what that list is going to be for you. Once you get that list, then you prospect them. The reason why we're so successful in our business and what we do, and, because David and I are always on the phones doing this, right? Smile, dial, make a pile. We're on the phone. We don't leave our business to fate. Where a lot of guys and a lot of gurus will teach you, go out by the list and spend thousands of dollars mailing them to you. You guys have heard me tell you before, our marketing budgets, and ask my lovely, I got to call you out, my lovely assistant is actually in the audience today, India. Raise your hand, hello. Our marketing budget is less than $1,000 a month, right? Because this is what we do. So you can buy business, you can wait for business, or you can let it come to you. Right? You can buy business, you can wait for business, or you can let it come to you. Or you can get on the phone and be proactive and go after it. So the reason why I mention that is because once you get your list, for multifamily, David and I have found the best list is CoStar. C-O-Star, S-T-A-R. We've tried and we've experimented with other lists. We've tried listability, which you can buy multifamily properties. It's junk. For multifamily, it's really good for other things. Absentee homeowners, listability, fantastic. We target investors. We target high net worth individuals. We use listability, right, to invest in our property, syndication models, that type of stuff. <coughs> CoStar, we have found. David, would you say that's probably safe assessment so far? CoStar has been the number one. Yeah. CoStar is pretty much the commercial real estate database. And now here's the thing: it's Commercial multifamily is five units or above. One to four units, you're going to get on the MLS. Okay? But CoStar will give you all on market and off market multifamily properties. It will give you a ton of good information owners, contact phone number, name, address, everything right there within the system. You don't need to go further than that. Now, it's expensive. You're playing in a different ballgame, right? But uh, that's been my number one resource. And then you just go from there. You can send mail. We send mailings. Don't, don't get me wrong. We send mailings to them, right, every week. But more importantly, everything that we've gotten so far, the vast majority of it, has been then taking that list and calling. Yeah, so Owner. Co-Star, Co-Star owns uh, LoopNet as well. So I would say LoopNet's like the yellow of commercial. And then CoStar would be closer to the MLS that you can get paid for. Yep. Good question. So you guys see I'm holding an eraser today because I usually have the marker and I'm clicking it constantly and it shows up in the audio. So I have set myself up for success with, with an eraser. So go ahead, question. So right now I'm, I've been currently prospecting for at least an hour a day every day. Are you part of yeah. RDI? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So right now... Because you look familiar, that's why I ask. I saw you on the... I sneak, I look. I check those things out. I, I sneak peek. I'm in and out. Go ahead. Sorry. So how do you know when to door knock? When do you door knock? Yeah. What do you mean? How do you know when do you door knock? So right now I'm getting a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, we have a couple houses that are up for sale, you know, on this block. Yeah. Well, how, how do I know if that's even worthy enough to even go down for dollars or even to door knock? Look, man. So when you when we talk about sales, 
uh, your name of your game is to contact and have conversations with as many people as you physically can stomach in a day, right? And my door knocking regimen used to be really strict. It got down to one day a week just for time constraints. But I found the best time to go out and door knock was Saturdays. Everybody was home. And so what he's asking is, how do you find out what's the best time to door? Look, the more doors you knock on, the more opportunities you're going to get. I always say you're one conversation away from changing your, your life, your success dramatically. So the name of the game is just have more conversations, right? And so door knocking is a very powerful part of being a successful salesperson where um, you got, you're picking up the phone and dialing, and then sometimes you just say you get in a car and you just go out and knock on doors. You do it at least once a week, right? So am I helping answering your question? or Because uh, you asked, how do you know when you should door knock? You should always be door knocking. It's a very, very powerful sales technique. What do you mean? <laughs> Not absentees. That was, that was pretty good. Thank you. How do you know which door to knock on? So that's, you, you, it starts with your list in your business. What type of properties are you trying to target, right? And so if you have this big, massive target that you're trying to door knock, some of them may just be crappy deals that you don't want to go after. You need to narrow your list down, and then you need to get your list to what it is and where you want to be, right? The types of properties that you want to invest in, your A properties. Look through your list that you have. Like David and I used to sit down and, and look, and India did a good job. Actually, India would map them all out for us, right? She'd map them out. Say, we go to India, and we'd say, look, we want to go door knock Garden City today. India, take 10 properties in Garden City and map them out. We're going to go hit them all, right? But you gotta you gotta narrow your list down to the to the properties that you can actually envision yourself buying. If you got crappy things on your list and they shouldn't even be there, you're wasting your time. Yeah, I, I, I've talked to people before and they they mentioned going and just picking a random street and door knocking. I Don't do that. No. The worst thing to do, you you know, the core of sales is finding a problem and solving it. You can do it. So uh, you want to look for the people like your probates. Or um, what we look for foreclosures, but also the the property style that you're looking for. So, like, you got to define your, your investment criteria. Like for me, I won't buy a property. I buy properties between eighty that will resell between eighty thousand and five hundred thousand. Anything less than that, we don't look at. Anything over that, we don't look at. Right. And so, you got to define your core criteria. We have a list of cities that we don't invest in. So every time we buy a list, if those cities are on there, we whack them off the list. Because you get what you focus on, right? And so if you have this really broad list of everything under the sun, you're never going to be able to tackle it at all. But if you can refine it down to your top two, 300 areas that you want to invest in, the top 200, 300 properties that you want to invest in, then you take that list and you break it down and you say, three times a week I'm going to knock on 10 of these doors. And today is going to be Garden City. Tomorrow is going to be Livonia. The next day is going to be Westland. Then you're only knocking on the doors for the properties that you really want. Does that make sense? You gotta refine you gotta refine your, your list. And you gotta break it down and say, if you got crappy properties on that list, you gotta get them off. You gotta get them off that list. Okay? Hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Go ahead. Um, my question is, um, for you guys, what have you found that working in terms of acquiring leads? Yeah. So, good question. So, what lead source has we found? You're talking fix and flips? Or rentals? Or what are you looking for? So, our business, um, most success in our business for fix and flips comes from foreclosure properties. Six, about 60% of our business is foreclosures. And so, as you guys know, in Michigan, there's different levels of foreclosure. There's pre-foreclosure. You can go down to the auction and buy foreclosures, or you can buy after the sheriff sale has occurred, right? You can do redemptions. So about 60% of our business has been foreclosures. Um, outside of that, our second biggest category has been probates. And you can get probates from U.S. lead lists is a source that we recommend often. You can manually get probate leads. You can go right down to the courthouse and get them for free. Or you can go on legalnews.com, which is Michigan's um, site for all these public notices. And you can select the category that says probates, 
or you can select the category that says foreclosures and get all the notices of probates and foreclosures at a very nominal charge. But our two, in our business, our two biggest lead sources come from um, our top three in this order would be foreclosures, probates, and then sphere of influence. You guys in this room saying I got a deal. A lot of wholesalers. Now, there's a lot of wacky wholesalers out there, as you guys know. <laughs> but, but there are some very good ones, and a lot of them are sitting right in this room right now. Okay, um, and, and they're a good source, because they, they know if you're a buyer and you're performing, they're going to come to you first, and they're going to say, hey, here's a deal. Right? So wholesalers as well. So in those top three categories. Does that help you out a little bit? Okay. Well, the, side note, wholesalers sell for the highest bidder, they'll be cheap either. <laughs> <laughs> they come in and bitch about not getting deals. That's right. And you talk about wholesalers, you got one of the best ones right here in the room right here. So latch on to those guys, okay? Good question. Go ahead. Question for you regarding um, your list and you're making and, and you make calls. When you're going through your list to pull the numbers, I know you mentioned um, a couple companies that you use, whether it be subscription days, white pages. Sure, sure. How does that system work? Do you go in there, like if you're using white pages, and you've got your list of 500 names of, of List. Good question. Like, yeah. Are you going through this and, and tracking each one down, or are you pumping it into some sort of system that filters it for you? Or the phone numbers? Pulls all the numbers out for you. Good, good, good question. So, how do we get the numbers? Is it one at a time or like a bulk, like a batch system? Yeah. Yeah. So, if we, so we use a company called Vulcan 7. Vulcan's like, I guess, Star Trek, right? Vulcan. Is there Vulcans in Star Trek? Okay. Vulcan, how do you spell it? V U L C A N? The number seven. Uh, and they are a system where if you have, India, what was the, do you remember the minimum leads that had to be sent to Vulcan to batch? 20. So if you have 20 names or more, you send them to Vulcan and they'll batch them. And so they'll, so it could be up 20 names, 10,000 names, whatever. They charge what, like 10 cents a name, I think? That's not 50 cents. I don't know. I don't look at the bill. So maybe it's 50 cents. <laughs> Uh, they'll do your batch system. So if you get like an absentee list or an inherited list, then you run that through a company like Vulcan 7, and then they'll come back and they spit up to five phone numbers. And Vulcan is is a company that um, I have found to be very accurate. I mean, you're getting cell phone numbers. How they do it, I don't know and I don't care, but you're getting direct numbers to these people, and they pick up the phone and say, how the heck did you get my number? Okay, and so I've tried them all, and those guys are the most accurate. Now, if you're not looking to batch, if you're 20 or less, believe it or not, what we have found to be, like, let's just say you're driving through the neighborhood, you're driving for dollars, or you're out door knocking, and you find a property, you want to get a hold of the homeowner, they're not at the house, right? Uh, White Pages Premium is the one-off. We have found to be very successful, very, pretty, pretty well accurate. And then you can just type in and get one-off phone numbers for stuff. You drive through a neighborhood, you see an abandoned house. Hey, I'd like to get a hold of a homeowner. White Pages Premium for that. Does that help you out a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, typically, typically there's a minimum with those. I know Vulcan's 20. But so what we're talking about, guys, is when you get, everything starts with your list, your data point. When we're talking about real estate investing, where are you getting your leads from? If you buy an app T list, you can mail them, right? But I'll tell you, my success, there, it, it, our business consistently would do 10 to 12, and I say would because we're moving on and we're doing more multifamily. We're, we're slowing down on the residential stuff, okay? But consistently, our business would do 10 to 12 fix and flips a month. And 90% of those fix and flips came from this, calling them, not marketing them. Can you say that one more time? What's that? You say what? Called them and got deals off the telephone. Telephone, ninety percent of our deals. I went from two deals a month deals? to ten to twelve deals a month by doing this. Okay, by picking up the phone, by picking up the phone and calling. Did you guys hear that? Deals did you do this? Like a lot. Plus? Right. <laughs> okay, that's for my benefit. That's, <laughs> that's for your own gratification. <laughs> so, so I encourage you guys to do that. I encourage you when you get these lists. If you're really seeing now, some people in this room they do one, one or two deals a year. That's okay. You'll get that from marketing. But if you really want to start to you know, what they talk about, and I love this word now, 10x your business, and you want to do 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 deals, whether it's rentals or fix and flips, it's this, guys. Don't be scared to do it. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. Right? Go ahead, Jeremy. How long did it take you to get comfortable 
on the phone? <laughs> and how many hours did you have to practice before you were really good on the phone and you can set appointments and get deals consistently? And did it happen like magic overnight with fairy it dust? It took me, honestly, I remember this very vividly. When I started, I always thought I was a good sales guy until, until what I learned what sales really was, right? Sales is not telling, it's asking good questions, okay? And uh, it took me about two years to get really comfortable and good, and I would track. And so I started as a real estate agent, as most of you guys know, because nobody, when I was 17, would give me money to invest in properties. And they still wouldn't give me money until probably about 25, and then you got people who lined up and want to give you money. I said, where were all you guys for the last seven years of my life? Um, but I remember this very vividly because I started um, prospecting on the phones, and we would track our numbers. And so we would say, you know, how many calls do we have to make to get an appointment? And the goal is, is you want to go from like 10 calls to get one appointment to one call, you get one appointment. So you track those ratios. And it took me about two years, even like closing ratios. If I went on a listing appointment, what was my closing ratio? Was it seven out of 10, right? And you start to improve those numbers. When you're really good at sales, you start to say, okay, this This year, I want to get to 8 out of 10. I want to get to 10 out of 10 appointments, and then you can watch your income go up. But it took me two years nonstop prospecting. And, oh, by the way, we role-played every day. We broke into teams and role-played every day, practiced, rehearsed, scripts. Uh, Two years nonstop of prospecting two hours a day before I felt, ah, I'm comfortable. Oh, and by the way, you never get comfortable. Take a week vacation and get back on the phones. Even 10 years into this, you're a little rusty. So your first, I always say when I sit down at Prospect, your first five calls, call people you hate. <laughs> right? Don't call, your, <laughs> don't, call your, don't, don't call somebody who you're just trying to close your big deal, you know? Call the first five people you hate or you really don't want to talk to and just get all that mumble jumble out of your way and then, and then you get into your groove. There's a little rust that comes off. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. It could be 20 years. And you're still uncomfortable. You know, it's not natural. It makes people uncomfortable. So, but uh, I will tell you this. It's, it's uh, when, you, when you prospect like that, you control your business. And so I know, for example, I've got to go on five appointments to buy one property, to buy one property that's going to make me $20,000 on a fix and flip. And in order to do that, I need to make 100 phone calls. So if I make 100 phone calls, I'm going to get five appointments. I'm going to buy one property. And so when I'm sitting there for the week and I say, oh, man, I am probably use some extra money or the bills are coming in, I know without doubt the only thing I have to do that day or that week is make 100 phone calls. I'll get a deal, right? And so that's why, that's, that's why it's important to track your guys' numbers as well because you can control your income. You want a paycheck? Track your numbers. What's it going to take to get you your paycheck? Your ratios may not be that. It may be 200 phone calls to get a deal. Right? But if you know that number, then you get excited because you know every time somebody tells you to screw off, hey, are you interested in selling your property for 50 cents on the dollar? No, screw off. Okay, thank you. 99 more to go. Right? You guys get excited about it. And, it's, and I'm serious. You, you'll get, the numbers don't lie when you track your numbers. What you, what you track, you can improve. If you guys aren't tracking your numbers, now, again, we're talking people who want to turn this into a, a serious business. There's people out there just trying to get one deal, okay? And, and this stuff may be a little intense at this point, but there may be a time in your life where you come and you say, I want to do 10 deals a year or 20 deals a year or 50 deals a year. That's how you get there, right? That's the next level stuff. So I don't know how we got on that topic, but it's a good topic. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you. Two years it was, guys, before it finally clicked. And let me take a step back and say, and Jeremy knows this, and some of you guys know this, I used to spend from like 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon till 9 o'clock at night doing another round prospecting in California because they were a couple hours behind us. So not only would I prospect in the morning here for two hours, but I'd prospect every night in California for another two hours because my commission checks in California, the average resale price, was a million dollars for a house. And my average commission check here in Michigan was like $3,000 buck, $3,000. My average check in California is like 16,000. And that was just a 25% referral fee. 
because I would prospect and set appointments for other real estate agents, have them go out, take the listing, sell the property, and they'd give me a 25% referral fee, which is about 16 grand. So many, many hours. When they say that old saying, you need 10,000 hours, what is it, to become an expert at something? It's probably pretty accurate. So good question. Come on, guys. I'm here to help you. I want to I wanna help you win. Go to the next level. Go ahead. To track these numbers? This is very complicated. Pay close attention. <laughs> the question was, what are you using to track these numbers? I sit down at my desk every day, and I write out on a notepad like this. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then I put them in an Excel sheet, and then I know my ratios. I have an Excel, a weekly, it's like a tracker, weekly tracker. We use it with coaching clients as well, too. David, are you using a weekly tracker? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's, that's what I use to track them. And then you can start to get your averages as well. And you can say, this week, I made 100 phone calls, and I got how many appointments? And then you... Over time, the numbers add up, and you know, you'll start to know how many calls you got to make to get how many appointments, how many appointments you go on to get a deal. And then when you really start to say, I want to go from 50 deals to 70, is you start to improve those ratios. So four out of five, right? And then how do you improve your ratios? You improve your sales skills. How do you communicate with people? Right? What are you saying on the appointments? What are you saying on the phone? That type of stuff. Good question. Cool. Come on, guys. Let's dive down into it. Don't leave here today with questions. I want to help you, and then I got a lot of knowledge for you. So, go ahead. I think John, ha John, and then uh, Tommy will go. So I'm just curious. I, I, mean, I wasn't here for the last month to talk about. So what are your guys' this year's point seven eight goals? Oh, good question. To basically look like you're moving out of that realm. Yeah. Very good question. Good question. So the goal was, what are our 2017 goals? So uh, David has convinced me to stop residential entirely because we're a very small show and uh, you get spread too thin. So we, back in December, cut off residential uh, fix and flips temporarily. There may be a time where we bring it back up and get somebody to run that part of the organization. But our big goal for 2017, we actually have a five-year goal it fits into, is we want $100 million in multifamily assets, 20 million a year. So our goal this year is to acquire 20 million in multifamily assets, 50 units or above. And uh, that's all we're focused on. Value add opportunities. So, and I think if any one of these pops, we'll probably hit that in January. Seriously, so, um, and we got a couple now that we're closing on as well. But uh, that that's, what we're working on. So, um, and in terms of the residential, we have a lot of uh, leads that still trickle in. Just being in this business for a decade, people that are looking to fix and flip, or people that have properties to sell, uh, we need people to outsource those to. So, if you guys have, <laughs> now we're not talking like you know fifteen a week or something like that, but we have a lot of friends and associates in this business that have deals um, that come on their table and they say, "Hey, here's a good fix and flip." Um, we won't take it right now because it's a distraction on our focus. We're, when we focus on something, we're like laser whack everything else out, right? Um, so um, we'll outsource them, and we outsource them to a lot of people in this room. So if anybody's got uh, or in is are looking for fix and flips, um, please email me direct. My email is on the board as they come across. Um, I will blast them out to you. I like to start with people in this room before we get to the whole list. Um, I have one right now that's on our plate that I'd love to get rid of. It's a property in Westland with Livonia Schools. So if you guys know that, it's very valuable. It's, it is an ugly property. All cosmetics. But worth about 150 We got it for 82 as a foreclosure. It needs about 35000 in renovations. And uh, it's available. As of right now, I just went through yesterday, secured the property, and took pictures. Um, we do own the property. So if anybody is looking for a fix and flip, 
Uh, it's a ranch in Westland. Please, see me. Serious people, okay, that really want to do the deal. Um, but I will tell you this, that property is very ugly. All cosmetics, structurally sound, it's got a new roof, foundation, everything's good. But uh, it's not for the weak of heart. I'll tell you that, okay? So, good, good questions, guys. Keep them coming. Come on, fire them at me. Go ahead, Tommy, you had one. Um, what do you guys use for incoming call tracking? But probably you don't because it looks like you only outbound market, right? Any incoming call tracking, I use a very advanced system. Uh, her name is India. <laughs> no, Tommy, I'm just playing with you. Um, incoming calls, uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate enough where we have an assistant who will take all of our incoming calls. So she'll take them and put them on a lead sheet. But yeah, it is, it is very few. Um, but to expand on that note, um, I have used at times a virtual assistant. And I use a company called Pat Live. And do you know Pat Live? They're phenomenal. They're really, really good people. So have you had a good experience with them? Have you I used them? I haven't used them okay. I'm not, we're not that big. But Pat okay, Live. Call okay, CallRail? Yeah. Okay. Does somebody answer the phone? Well, if you want. Oh, if, if you, you want. Or you answer the phone. Okay. So it scrapes all the data. So even okay. if they hang up in the middle of your day, It still collects their data? Yeah. And it puts it into your Podio workflow. Nice. You guys deal with that yeah, so Pat Live, so like a CRM. Pat, Pat Live has that capability, but they also, so if you guys don't know what we're talking about, uh, Pat Live is a service, a virtual call answering service. Well, a person will pick up your phone, and they have a script, and say, hey, thank you for calling XYZ Company. Uh, you know, Tommy's not available right now, but if I can get some uh, information from you, I'll have him return your call. Whatever you want him to do, just like an assistant. I'll have him return your call today between 5 and 6, or I'll have him return your call, and they collect all the information. But then their systems also capture that if it's a call and hang up. So it's not just contingent on the live person. But I've used that, and I found that to be one of the best. And then I think you've got one that you're using now. So well, the call rails are automatic. 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 Okay. Systems. No one answers. Computer, yeah. Takes the data, puts it in your Podio workflow, which will send it to wherever you want it to go, and then you can have it do whatever you want. Call your cell phone, call 